All right, today we're talking about the Weber Workshop's key grinder. This is the Mark II or second generation version. This is very interesting, some of the things that are going on here and people seem to have pretty polarized takes on this grinder. Definitely one of the pricier grinders around at 21, 2200 bucks. And the question is, should you consider it or maybe who is this grinder for? And we're gonna try and answer that today. The key is a single dosing grinder, meaning you weigh and grind up one serving of coffee at a time. It's stepped which means you have these settings that you can click into rather than this one sort of fluid infinite adjustment. And despite its super compact size, it uses this massive 83 millimeter coated burr from Mazer. It's got a power switch on the back here, RPM control right here on the side, a little brush that pops out. This is kind of neat, pretty cool. You know, it's got this sleeve that you slide over the end and you can put it back in. And then when you pull it out again, the sleeve is pulled back. It's very cool, very artisanal. And then an on and off switch, which lights up right here. You load the beans right in here, drop this little lid down and they'll come out in this little catch cup that they call the magic tumbler. More on this in a bit. This specific grinder is on loan to me from Weber Workshops. It's gonna to need to go back to them once I'm all finished here. Now, if you're not familiar with Weber Workshops, they make several different grinders and coffee accessories produced in relatively small numbers and at very high quality. All the products are designed by Doug Weber, who's an ex-Apple product person, and Weber Workshops is based out of Japan with a, another small assembly workshop in Taiwan. And Weber grinders have a very interesting dynamic that goes along with them. Because they have that higher price point, people generally tend to look at them online for a long time before they ever end up buying one. My first kind of serious coffee grinder was called a rock grinder, and it was pretty janky in some ways, but it did make very good espresso. Then I had my first exposure to Weber, and the grinder that I saw was the grinder called the HG1. When I saw this thing, it kind of seemed like that grinder that I was using at the time, just kind of perfectly refined, way out of my price range, but I kept going back to it and looking at it. And then a few years ago, Weber released this grinder, the Key, the Mark I version though. And it really is almost like an electric version of the HG1, all wrapped up in this really compact footprint. Now, both the Key Mark I and the HG1 had some, let's say, issues. And we're gonna talk about that. But just look at this grinder, like it is a beautiful, piece of equipment. And that made me kind of nervous to review this grinder, not because I was worried about what anybody might think about the things that I have to say, but what if I got it and after all this time, I actually didn't like it very much or I found something wrong with it. And this grinder, it does have its quirks. You know, I've been using it for several months now and it's a little quirky. And if you're an owner, I think I actually have some tips for you that are really gonna make your life a lot easier. But first, I think we should just make a cup of espresso and get ourselves a cup of coffee here. Now, one of the things I have really enjoyed about this grinder and this burr set in particular is I find it really forgiving. There's a nice open sweet spot there and it can be very easy to dial in. This is a very small tin of coffee from Sorolina. It's expensive. It's a variety called Sudan Rume. And I have about 38 grams of it left. I have used most of it making pour overs. And now I've taken it into my head that I would like to try it out on espresso. Now, 38 grams is about two doses of espresso. And if you've ever dialed in an espresso, especially a lighter roast, you know that you can blow through a lot of coffee. So I've taken a guess on the grind size. Let's weigh out a dose and see how we do. So I'm gonna weigh out 18 grams. I'm gonna give it one little spritz of water. This is called RDT, if you've never looked at that. I'm gonna give it a little bit of a shake. I'm gonna turn the grinder on and then I'm gonna put the coffee in. We're gonna pull this magic tumbler off. Now there is another accessory that you can put on right here. This is called their, I think they call it a magic wiper. And I don't really love using this. It kind of makes it awkward to get this tumbler on and off. I find a spritz of RDT along with shaking the tumbler really just does enough of a good job. So I'll leave this off. Now I'm gonna give this a shake shake. We're gonna talk about this a little bit more in a sec. Just gonna go kind of irregular here. 
Going to do a little move here. And then we're going to drop the tumbler right onto our porta filter. I'm going to pull out the center, give it a little twist, little dingle in there. Then I'm just going to do a little twirl and that'll nicely distribute the coffee. All right. So I got very lucky there. Time-wise, it dialed in exactly where I was hoping to. Let's see how it tastes. All right. Okay, that is uh, really good. Wow, very round, very sweet. Nice acidity coming through. Nice milky texture. Mm, I'm even getting some, uh, some florals, very fruity. Mm, very good. Okay, that is a great shot. And that has been my experience with this grinder. You get your coffee, you try to dial it in, and odds are you can usually get pretty close to where you want to be with it within the first shot or two. And even if you don't, the flavor tends to be pretty forgiving and pretty good. Now, I do want to talk about the burrs here for a minute. And we really should look at the differences between flat burrs and conical burrs, because a lot of the grinders at this price point are gonna be flat burr grinders. Now, often you'll see it generalized that conical grinders will give you this thick, syrupy, traditional style of espresso shots. You know, not a lot of definition, sometimes a little muddy, but tending to be very sweet and syrupy. And then you have flat burrs, which tend to be more known for their lighter body, better flavor separation, clearer profile. The reality is there is a lot of overlap, but that's a generalization that a lot of people make. As far as this specific burr is concerned, I get a very nice rounded profile from this burr. And that profile actually shifts pretty significantly in my experience, depending on how you have this RPM set down here. We're gonna really go down the rabbit hole on that in a sec. Overall, definitely a more blended, let's say, profile than some of the flat burrs that I would typically use. The Zerno Z1 back there, it's loaded with SSP HUs, and I do find on the whole, I get a little bit more body from this, a little bit more of that velvet mouthfeel, a little bit sweeter, while I find the HUs give a little bit lighter body and they can be a little bit punchier in some ways. Now, typically flat burrs will have a much narrower sweet spot and a lower margin of error. You know, I would not have tried to pull a stunt like this on a grinder like that. Well, sometimes maybe I would, but not most of the time. On a lot of flat burr grinders, if you miss the mark in terms of time, you know, you pull a little long or a little short, you know, you'll give it a little taste and then you may be inclined to pass that shot to the sink. With this grinder, however, I was finding it was a lot shorter of an on-ramp to a very delicious shot. And even if I was a little long or a little short, I was finding still the shots were generally pretty enjoyable to drink. And the reason for that is something called particle size distribution. Basically, what are the different sizes of all of the little pieces of coffee that are kind of coming out of here. On a grinder like that, all the particles are gonna be a lot closer to being the same size. A grinder like this, it's gonna have more what's called boulders, large particles, as well as more fines, little tiny dusty particles. And that brings me to something else a little bit strange that you saw me doing, shaking the grounds. I tried it on a higher uniformity grinder like that and I didn't see a huge noticeable difference. On this grinder, I found there actually was a significant and notable difference in consistency and how well the shots were pulling when I would shake it. And what that does is it homogenizes the grounds. It takes all those fines and boulders and really mixes them up from however they're falling out of here in a way that is very favorable and makes for much nicer pulling, more predictable shots. Some Weber owners really swear by this and the crew at Weber actually has like the shaking technique where you're kind of gently tossing the grounds around, doing this like washing machine move, they call it, then putting it on your porta filter, pulling the thing out and doing this little swirl. And <laughs> I could barely believe this, but when you can get that into your muscle memory and stick that. You don't actually even need to do WDT. You can just tamp and go. It does take a bit of a knack though. On the whole, 
If you're a key owner especially and you are not shaking, I would highly recommend that you start doing it because for me, it made a big difference. And some good news, I heard that Weber is gonna start including these lids with any grinder that comes with a Magic Tumbler, so that's fantastic. One other thing that was very surprising to me was what happened when you started messing with the RPM. This grinder, you can set the RPM from 30, which is very low, all the way up to 150, which is still pretty low. Typically, when you increase the RPM of a grinder, you speed it up. The grinder is going to create more fines, more of those really dusty particles in there. And usually what you expect to happen is you expect to see your shot slow down because the water is having a harder time working its way through all that. And on the key, it's actually the opposite that happens. At the same grind setting, at the max RPM, I was finding the shots could be up to 10 seconds faster than the same grind setting at the lowest RPM. Very much counter to what I would expect and very interesting to say the least. As far as why it's happening, not totally sure, but it was consistent and repeatable. Taste-wise, it was a little bit more in line with what I would expect to happen. You know, higher body, thicker shots at that high RPM range as a result of the increased fines. Lower RPM, I would get a little bit less body, a little bit clearer representation of flavors. As far as my personal preference, I found I was somewhere, you know, in and around the 60 to 70 RPM range. I did find that on the lower RPM settings, I tend to to prefer a slightly longer pulling shot at the same volume than I would normally expect on other grinders. Whereas at higher RPMs, I would prefer that time to be a little bit tighter. It's interesting, this shot that I pulled, I was hoping to actually hit just over 30 seconds. It came out that way and the result is fantastic. I think I'm just gonna finish this right now. Mm. So let's just say there's some very interesting flexibility when it comes to crafting the taste profile that you want. It is gonna be generally within those lanes though of more approachable, rounder, a little bit more blended. Okay, let's talk about some tests. Volume wise, I was finding at low RPM, it would come in, you know, mid to high 60 decibels, very quiet grinder. At high RPM, it was still quite quiet, coming in at about 10 dBs hotter, mid 70. DBs. As far as seasoning the burrs, Weber says they come, you know, kind of pre-seasoned. I definitely did find that they settled in over time. I ran about five kilos through and I did find it made a difference. What I will say is as long as I was shaking, the shots were enjoyable from day one, but they did get better over time. Retention on this grinder, it's billed as like a zero retention grinder. And in my experience, that was more or less true. What you put in, you tend to get out as long as you're using that RDT. Now, if you don't wanna do RDT, they do include the wiper, but as I said, it's a little awkward not totally my preference to use it, and it doesn't come pre-installed from Weber either. Some people find there is retention in this thing. Numerically, I didn't find it to be any kind of meaningful amount. If you shake it too vigorously, you will get some compacting and it will kind of stick to the walls. In my experience, you just gotta shake it a little bit lighter. And one other thing that helps is, you know, I'll often like brush that out. All right, fidelity on espresso is something else that I will often measure, especially with stepped grinders. How much variance in shot time is there from one step to the next? And in my experience, I was finding a shot time difference of about two to three seconds between each step. That's better than what I would see on a lot of grinders, so I didn't really find that there was any issue finding the sweet spot, especially with the more forgiving presentation that the spur provides. So that was great as well, not really feeling like I'm missing anything by having it stepped as opposed to stepless. At high RPM, I was finding it would go through a shot of espresso in about 10 seconds. Lower RPM, that would go up to, you know, just over 30 seconds. And as far as space goes, it is extremely compact. It's about 14 inches tall. So, you know, wherever you're planning on putting it, if this is something you're considering, just make sure you got the clearances there. It is one of the more compact grinders though, for sure. Now, as far as performance on 
pour over goes. It can do a good cup of pour over. You know, one grinder that this gets compared to a lot is the Niche Zero, you know, probably the most popular single dosing conical grinder out there. This burr, especially when you have the RPM cranked down, is like way ahead of the Niche Zero in terms of quality on pour over. But if you're a pour over first person, like that's your primary use case, I would say that there are other grinders that will give you a better cup of pour over for a lot less money. I found that gap was a little bit smaller on immersion brews. So if you're doing something like French press or aero press, or you have a Weber bird as well, that gap kind of closed a little bit. Still, I would consider this an espresso first grinder for sure. So overall, we seem to have some great tasting shots solid performance and at this point i would typically go online and start trying to unearth some issues that owners may have been having with this grinder and see if i can replicate those for myself and this is where you turn up a lot of stuff around the hg1 and the key version mark one you know, with the Key Mark 1 in particular, you saw a lot of people struggling with stalling while grinding for light roasts, particularly at low RPM. Weber made some changes for the Mark 2, and I've put a lot of light roasts through this grinder, and I haven't had any issues with that. To really push that, I put some green coffee through it at low RPM, and it was able to grind it. So that is fantastic. From my perspective, the changes Weber's made here have eliminated that issue. And then you get into alignment issues. Both the H HG1 and the Key Mark 1 had some issues with alignment. You know, it has this long shaft, and on those grinders, the burr was just kind of floating on the end there. So anything that is kind of off, you know, with the shaft or up here was really amplified by the time you got down to here with the way the burr was just kind of floating there. And with the conical burr especially, there's several axes of adjustment. If even one of them is off, you're gonna have issues with your particle size distribution, which can cause inconsistency in your shots, bad flavor, all kinds of nasty things. Weber made some changes with the Mark II. They added a lower bearing, which is kind of difficult to get in there and, and look at, but you can see it in this picture. And what that does is it stabilizes the bottom of that shaft. So it's gonna be, in theory, less prone to alignment issues. This unit was perfectly aligned. So I decided to see if I could go digging and find people online who had a Mark II version and were complaining of alignment issues. And I couldn't actually find one. I'm sure there are people out there who have had this issue, but it doesn't really seem to be a problem with the updates that Weber has made. Now, aligning a conical burr in any case, but especially in this setup, is really difficult to do. If you're an owner and you're struggling with inconsistency, number one, I would say start shaking that thing because that really helps out a lot. Number two, give yourself like at least three to five kilos. If you're still struggling with big consistency issues, reach out to Weber before you try and get in here and fix it yourself because you just go online and you see people trying to do this themselves and very often they actually make the problem worse. That being said, I don't really think it is an issue with the Mark II. So at this point, I was kind of starting to breathe a sigh of relief because I was nervous to try out this grinder because again, what if I didn't actually like it? There were these issues floating out there with the Mark I, but they pretty much seem to be resolved. Combined with good performance, what's not to love? Well, there are a few things, for my seat anyways. Dosing into this grinder, it's a little bit awkward. You can't really just dump into stuff because you're gonna bang into this mechanism up here. Also, as far as their included dosing cup, it's just kind of small and you can tell they've made it really narrow to try and work with this. I just don't like it. One other thing is, you know, they recommend doing a spritz of RDT. If you do too much RDT, the beans are gonna stick in here. You'll grind your coffee, take the thing off, shake it, and then you lift this up just to double check and you'll see a handful of beans just kinda sitting in there while the feeder's spinning around. There is a bit of a sweet spot when it comes to RDT. I found, you know, you do one spray, do it from a little distance away. That seems to minimize it, but it still can happen. And then if you do too little RDT, you're gonna have some issues with static and grounds clinging to the underside here. Again, it has the magic wiper, but no thanks. 
And you do actually need to use the slidey lid thing or you're gonna have beans popcorning out of the hopper here while you're grinding. And then if you ever go to grind a pour over, you have to lift this up and kind of twist it around like a full revolution. Not too crazy, but then when you wanna go back to espresso, you know, there can be like one boulder that is kind of just hanging out in the burrs there and is stuck. And if you go and you try and tighten it back up, the burr can like get stuck. And then you have to open it up a little bit, run the grinder for a sec, let it try and get that ground out and then try and tighten it again. And sometimes you have to do that a couple times to do the full revolution back down to espresso. And also don't do that when the grinder is running because otherwise, you know, you pull this up, this happened to me, everything just starts spinning around and it all gets a little terrifying. So, it's a little quirky. It's one reason why some of the takes around this grinder can be pretty polarized. The question is, should you actually consider one? And I think the answer to that, number one is, does it fit your budget? If it does, I think you need to ask yourself, what are you looking for in terms of taste? And what are you looking for in terms of experience? This grinder has been wonderful to have on bar for the few months that I've had it. It's compact. It looks fantastic. The shots taste great, are flattering and forgiving. The workflow, it can definitely be a little bit quirky. It is, however, very easy to dial in and the actual experience of touching it, interacting with it is really very nice. And the taste, I get a very nice rounded profile. The shots taste great. I find it really forgiving and it can be very easy to dial in. It's not gonna be the most high clarity grinder. You know, these high clarity grinders, they can really, you know, pull out flavor notes of these really nice, really delicate coffees. They can also be really hard to dial in and that level of clarity is not always going to be flattering. I found with this, I could just expect really good shots without a lot of effort. And as far as a lot of those workflow quirks, the overall experience of using it drinking the shots from it, the ease of dialing in, made a lot of that stuff a lot more palatable. So I think you need to ask yourself, what are you looking for? You know, if you're gonna spend this amount of money, is that the experience that you want? Or are you really looking for that higher clarity, higher flavor separation that's available with grinders like the EG1 or even the Zerno Z1 or other flatbird grinders? And I'm just gonna name this. For some enthusiasts, once you start looking at grinders of this price, you actually start looking at more than one and having complementary grinders on your bar for different uses. You know, when I wake up first thing in the morning and the kids are, you know, doing whatever, I don't wanna be fussing with dialing in a coffee. Coffee. I want to go whichever way the wind blows, pick the coffee that I want, take a flyer, and have a great cup. However, once they get on the bus, they're gone for the day. I really enjoy sitting down, tweaking things, and trying to get that highest clarity shot that I can. So having these two grinders on bar has been very nice. But if you are in the market for one grinder, there are going to be compromises. And I think that there is a lot of freedom to be found when you recognize that every grinder that you're going to look at is going to have compromises and you just need to choose the right set for you. If this video was helpful at all, I would love for you to subscribe to my channel. It's a free way that you can support me making more of these reviews. And I also want to hear your take on this and the key in particular. Are you looking at it? Are you can considering it? How are you weighing that decision? Are you maybe an owner? If you are, drop your experience so that people who are maybe considering picking one of these up can get another firsthand account. I hope your next cup of coffee is fantastic. This one certainly was, and we'll see you next time.